There we go. J.W. Wright. Well, nice are, to be here, man. Thanks. How are you this morning? Fantastic. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, as we, I didn't want to have too much conversation before we started recording because oh, yeah. I'll start like I'll uh, I'll just jump in with people and then I'm like we just had all this great conversation <laughs> and it's just um, and then I just I just lost it all. So, but we were kind of talking about um, we started talking about business some, mm-hmm. and I definitely would like to talk about that because. Um, You've just done so much in that space, especially for the jiu-jitsu community. Okay. But before we get there, um, for the folks who don't know, I would just like to take the time to um, just maybe a little recap as far as who you are um, jiu-jitsu-wise and you know, just your path with this and yep. just anything else you'd like to share. Just kind of background, just some background. Background. Um, traditional martial artists since I was uh, 15 and a half. And I always say that because the day I got my permit, I drove to a karate studio. Nice. You know, so I, I always had... Um, the want and the desire to learn martial arts, man. I mean, um, sounds cliche, but I watched the movies and yeah. Chuck Norris and all these guys, and I'm like, oh, wow, that just looks so cool. Uh, I grew up in a little town of Stillville, Missouri, so there's like 1,300 people, no martial arts academies, so limited for uh, the country boy to be able to find something to do in that avenue. Um, so eventually found uh, karate, drove there, and started training, Um found my way to jiu-jitsu that's a that's a long story but um i'm a third degree black belt under hoyler gracie lucky enough that i've been training with hoyler for it's almost 20 years now um hoyler gracie david and eve are really my mentors and my instructors uh lucky enough that i came from a traditional martial arts background sambo and judo i really enjoyed uh those arts as well okay um and then eventually found hoyler and just never looked back. Like uh, once you, I really found the purest source of jujitsu. Man, yeah. I, I knew I could spend a lifetime learning from him and still just get a just uh, a fraction, uh, a, a thimbleful of of his jujitsu changed my life. Yeah, I'm I'm nowhere near the level you are, but the the more I found, like the more I dive into jujitsu and the more I learn, I'm just like I don't know anything. It's <laughs> like, it, what in the world? It's consistently that way, and it's. Um, it never changes because I'm 42 now. So, um, you know, 20 somethings, you, your body just wakes up the next morning and you're ready to go. Or yeah, you, you bounce back pretty quick. And, um, you know, your body's always wrecked. Jiu jitsu and body, body being wrecked is, is something very, very common. But it kind of folds into uh, what kind of person do you want to be? Do you just, do you just stop? Do you just quit? You know, and that right. kind of, that, 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 will be very transparent through all aspects of life and business and, and mm-hmm. mentality or do you just keep going and I, I think that's one of those things um you just got to keep going keep, yeah keep, 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 keep training but uh ended up obviously uh got two kids got two boys so I love the martial arts I'm, I'm able to do that full-time and uh teach jiu-jitsu full-time um and Hoyler and David Eve gave me the the mentality uh, helped me mold, help mold me into that uh, mentality, and then um, now I hope I just keep helping other people. Keep helping other people. Yeah, that's a good mission to have. Yep, it's the best. And uh, you know, jujitsu is very telling about yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah. It'll, it'll reveal a lot about who you are. And I mean, you see it all the time. You see people. Um, you'll see guys and girls. You know, they'll get their their blue belt and they'll just stop. Yeah. You know, it's just too long of a journey. Yep, and um, you know, I was I was looking this morning, and um, I saw you were from Steelville. So I'm yeah. I'm actually I grew up in Potosi, Missouri. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, not too far. <laughs> not, so. not, not, yeah, man, we're not not th- uh, through the woods, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, all through the woods there. So yeah. um, it's it's funny hearing you say like you started tra- traditional martial arts with karate. I did the same thing, and yeah. um, it kind of seems like karate schools are kind of um, they're all throughout the country. Sure. Um, and um, for a while there, like, that was, like, the martial art to go to. You know what I mean? There wasn't the option of jujitsu or anything like that. Yeah. So you sought out to go, to go. you started with karate. Like, you mm-hmm. actually had to seek out that, right? That wasn't in Steelville, right? No. Where, where was that at? St. James. St. James? So, yeah, yeah. So uh, it was probably 25-minute drive right. each each way. Uh, that's always something funny, too. It's like I, I hear people like, oh, it's 15 minutes. or <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, you know, at the end of the day, like I used to fly to New York and Brazil and all these other places right. to trade, and we're complaining about, you know, 15, 20-minute drive. Right. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, I used to drive to St. James twice a week because uh, that was when the classes were in a, like, 120-year-old little school. Um, 
small little club, but man, that's that's how it all started. How long did you do that for until you transitioned into other <coughs> martial arts? Um, probably did it for two years. Um, so when I graduated high school, not a lot of opportunities in Stillville. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. So I saw float th- trips, flo- and that's what I worked. I, I worked at a canoe rental all through high school and flipping canoes and rafts. Yeah. And um, uh, I love the river. I still love the river. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I it, maybe we'll talk about it a little bit, but my farm actually is on the river. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So like, it, what's funny is that the place I used to camp and grow up 15 years ago, mm-hmm. I I actually own now. Oh, really? Yeah. Where's so, that at? Uh, it's in Stillville, mm-hmm. and it's basically uh, if you've ever floated in the Merrimack, you see this big bluff that people jump off of. Yeah. It's, uh, I own the farm right uh, across from it. Really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so it's um that's been a dream come true for me this last year to uh, be able to kind of seek out my roots. I never know I'd, I'd have a place back down there, but mm. I actually have my jujitsu camps there. So, uh, again, it kind of all, all yeah. folds in together. It all came full circle. Yeah, um, yeah that's really cool because, um, I mean, growing up in that area, float trips are like a regular oh, thing. Man. So, Hooza Valley. And, of course. And uh, the, is it is bass? Is bass yep. something? I don't yeah, know. Yep. Uh, it's bass canoe. Uh, just bass canoe. Yeah. yeah. So, just floating down those. I, I remember doing that as a kid, and we do it every year now. So mm-hmm. it's pretty cool, and I I I know exactly the exact bluff it's you're talking e- yeah, about. It's e- yeah, there's a real cold spring. Yeah, like right down there, it's like super freezing. Everybody yeah. gets in, so it's always fun. Yeah, that's really cool, and it's funny how things come really full circle. Um, I know, like growing up, um, like you're always you're always seeking. You're like, what else is out there? Yeah, and um, you kind of shun like your roots, like where you come from. You do to yeah. a, to a degree. You know what I mean? Like yeah. searching for that other thing. And I just made a post pretty recently about how. Um, now, like, I'm kind of in a place to where, like, I, like, accept and, like, I really cherish those country roots. Yeah. So it's just, it just kind of rang a, it struck a chord when you said that. Like, you never anticipated going back down there. You really didn't. And then yeah. now you have, you know, have a farm, and I, I imagine it's a pretty important part of your life now. It's, it's huge, you know, and, um, the one thing I really realized was my, my sons are 15 and 12. Um, at 15 years old, like, that was my life, like being on the river fishing and mm-hmm. hunting. And I mean, that was such a big part. And uh, my son had none of that. Like I, I, I'll try to expose them to different things, mm-hmm. but I, I don't, I, in all honesty, like I don't care if they do jujitsu. I hope they do. Right. I hope they choose it. I hope they go hunting with dad. But if they choose not to, I, my youngest son is the most soft hearted, great individual kid. He couldn't hurt an animal ever. Yeah. And, and I'm totally okay with that. I'm right. I, I'm I'm happy that his heart's that big, but I can at least expose them to what it, like to go fishing. So this this summer, my son was like, "Hey, Dad, can I bring a couple of my buddies down?" And he goes, "I want I want to take them fishing." And I'm like, "Oh yes, you know it's just a yeah. little, you know just a little success on the on the on the dad front of like, yeah, man, you, you bet. Let's let's get him out there. Let's go fishing." Mm-hmm. Um, so when he was proactively and he didn't have that in his life before this year. I felt really good about myself. I was like, oh, you're exposing them to something different. They're finding some enjoyment. Um, and that's just like jujitsu or anything else. You know, we, we see people in their 40s or 50s, 60s, 70s. Like, it doesn't matter what age. Like, if you have the avenue or a platform for success for people or a platform for their own improvement, you see it. Yeah. You, you give it to them, and then sometimes they take it, sometimes they don't. Right, yeah. But, I mean, the important part, like you said, is just giving them the exposure. That's it. You give know, them the chance. Give them the option. Um and and see what kind of grows from there you yep. know what i mean and especially you know it's it's so important just to reconnect with nature i mean i'm sure oh. you feel like a million times better when you come back from the farm I, just to disconnect a little bit i on sunday i kn- it's a 90 minute drive there and 90 minute drive back i drove 90 minutes just to be in the woods for two hours <laughs> it's you, totally worth it and though. it was totally worth it yeah. and, I, and uh, my wife looks at me like you know, you're crazy you're you're in the car for three hours i go but those two hours and not having a cell phone being dis- disconnected really is um, it what it's what brings me back to level, right? You know, and I, I I find few things put me on a beach, a sandy white beach with blue water. I'm on a reset. Put me in the woods. I'm I'm just as good. Right. Yeah. It's so important to have that reset. So so important. So you have your annual camp out there now, right? Yep. Well, this this year will be our tenth year having our camp. So um, man, blink of an eye and ten years. Ten years like goes by. Yeah. So I've been lucky enough that. I always try to have a simple understanding of my students will get a base of instruction from me, but I want to put truly great instructors in front of them. 
you know, like our job really isn't to teach you everything you know. Our job is to put you in a position to be able to learn everything from everyone you, you sit in front of. So if I can put other truly great individuals in front of these guys, my students are just like sponges. Right. So they just take it all in. We have a great time. Um, the one thing that it probably is a common denominator about the whole group and any instructor that I keep having back over years and years is they're all just chill. Yeah. They're relaxed guys. Um, the group that we've had the last few years, Paulo Brando, which is a fifth degree black belt uh, from Grace Umida in Brazil, world champion, uh, runs Grace Umida Austin. Paulo's just one of the sweetest guys in the world. Like, nice. I love, love that guy to death. Um, Kyle Watson from Watson's M uh, mm -hmm. MMA down yeah. here. Uh, I wish I had more time to spend with Kyle. Like, it's one of those guys that, like, I just have so much fun with, mm -hmm. with him. And we're just both busy guys. Yeah, I mean, you guys have big schools. We're, we're working hard. Um, so that weekend, we always make a point. Like, I always say it's my favorite weekend of the year because I just get to hang out with my buddies. Right. Um, and then Sean Hammonds from uh, Nashville MMA and Sean Hammonds Jiu-Jitsu Association uh, down in Tennessee. And I think he's got, like, 60 or 70 schools affiliated with him now. Oh, wow. He is uh, just salt of the earth person. You know, literally, I think each one of those guys has told me, I don't care if you pay me, I'm going to show up anyway. You know, and that's, that's the... That's awesome. Yeah, so it's just like you you get those people that truly just want to be uh, in that environment. This year, Sean uh, is also a, a recording artist, so he plays country music. Okay. And um, he'll he'll just sit, grab his guitar and play for everybody. And he, I think he played for like three hours at the camp. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, man. So we're all just sit, you know, sitting back, relaxing. You're sitting underneath the stars in a beautiful yeah. area and listening to great music from great people. Like uh, Our motto's always been good people, great jujitsu. And, it, man, it's we're, we've been very, very blessed. I've had a lot of world-class jujitsu uh, jiu -jitsu instructors at that event over the years. But those are the, like my core group that just keep coming back. And they're like, please have me back. And my students see that. And it's just not my students. Kyle students, uh, Apollo students, Sean students. I mean, it's open to anybody that wants to come. Um, but I think everyone that gets there is always surprised at how laid back everyone really is. Yeah. It's it's a pretty unique atmosphere. I think that's an awesome mantra. Um, good people, great jujitsu. Because it starts with the people. It's Yeah. It really does. And um, you're talking about, you know, you're... you're putting together this camp and you have community and um, everybody's just out there just with the intent of just connecting and just being better people when it's all said and done, learning some jujitsu. And um, I think that's real common with just the jujitsu community as, yeah. as a whole. I mean, obviously there's always exceptions, but my experience um, has been everybody's just so chill. Everybody's just like, everybody's confident in themselves yeah. and they always just, especially the higher ups, right? I mean, the black belts, um, I feel like to reach that point in the sport, it, there's there's definitely a, a mental transition to where you become much more, not everybody, but purpose driven to where like you just really want to see other people grow yep. and do better, and um, it's just really cool to interact with those people. Um, this is this year is my first year going to IBJJF uh, World Masters. Oh, that's cool! And um, I saw you walking around there like you're a super busy guy. Yeah, I don't know how you can keep track of it all. I think we had 36 people competing. And they're just, but you know that event, it's crazy. Yeah. And they're just spaced out enough to where it drives you insane. Mm -hmm. So you're bouncing back and forth, running around crazy, and you still miss people and miss matches. But we try to very strategically plan with the team. Hey, these guys are within 45 minutes of each other. There may be a overlap. Right. So we, we try to do the best we, uh, we can to plan, but I try to do the best I can for my students. Um, I didn't get to compete this year. I got a few injuries that I got need to take care of, but that's even a more, a bigger dynamic. When you try the year before, I tried to compete and coach, coach and we did some uh, a lot of stuff with Fuji. And I realized, like, man, that's tough. That's, yeah, it's really tough to take it. Uh, you can't be everything for for everyone or um, everything. So, but you know, it's I, I, I again just love the sport so much mm -hmm. that 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 trip to Vegas. I actually like it being in Vegas because. Um, over that period, it seems like people relax a little bit. Yeah. You know, they have some time. It's a vacation destination, yeah. so they realize that I'm going to compete on Wednesday or Thursday. I'm going to stay the rest of the, right. the weekend. So we have some great dinners and great conversations. Mm -hmm. um, it was the first time that I was able to get all my franchises together with Jimmy Pedro and all the Fuji team. We went and had a nice dinner and got some feedback from those guys. So it's it's experience, but um, like like 
your first time competing, what what did you what did you think about it? So um, for me, having competed and well, having first been exposed to like one on one competition through wrestling, and then just mm-hmm. like hundreds of matches with that. Oh yeah, and then f- having fought professional MMA. Um, I don't get like overwhelmed because it is a it's a huge tournament. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're running they're running the Las Vegas Open and Worlds at the same time. You know, there's tons of vendors everywhere. I love the energy. Um, the biggest thing that stuck out to me was how many. Well, one is a dangerous week to be in Vegas, right? All the oh my god, lots of dangerous. But <laughs> how sweet all those guys are. I mean, just world champions just sitting in the crowd, taking yep. pictures, being super cool with everybody. Um, yeah, the the event itself though was it was kind of weird because you hear things about IBJJF, you hear horror <laughs> stories, <laughs> right. and um, you kind of see some matches, and you kind of sh- kind of like scratch your head, it's like hmm, and it's just kind of cool. It's it's interesting to see that, but all in all, it's just a great experience. You know what I mean? Yeah. You get to see some amazing jujitsu. Um, yeah, you get to connect with a ton of great people. I just I learned a whole bunch just being there. I was just trying to just take it all in. You know what? It's um I I think if you let it, it never you never stop learning. Right. Uh, from the standpoint, you know, I got there on Wednesday night and did the four and a half hour rules meeting. So like, wow, four and a half hours of sitting there and going through the the sport of jujitsu and what the referees are looking for, and being a tournament owner, like I want to know, IBJJF is the premium. Man, they they are the number one event in the world. They're the biggest. Uh, jiu-jitsu company in the world and i think in all honesty they're trying to do the right thing i think they're in a, uh, a business that gets a lot of flack because number one they're successful mm-hmm. and you're going to get flack if you're successful no matter what right two they're always trying to innovate and and make the process better and within that you're going to make mistakes and mm-hmm. once you have 20 i think they had 21 mats on the uh, master side, mm-hmm. and then they had another eight, eight or I six think. or eight on yeah. the other side. So you, I mean, from a standpoint of I've run twelve mats before, and I know what kind of day that is. You're running thirty almost. That's just insane. The amount of referees, the helpers, everything. So I think they do a great job, but you know, there's there's always those calls that you, you shake your head over mm-hmm. and you don't understand. And um, I'm, I would say that most of the time. I can at least talk to the uh, a referee and I say, explain what you saw. Yeah. I think that's really important to do because I may see something different and they explain what they saw and it makes sense. I may not agree. That's, right. You know, the match may be so close. Uh, we lost um, a girls' brown belt match in the finals by a referee's decision uh, and I just could not agree. I just I saw the match completely different and uh, – he kind of shrugged his shoulders like he just made a decision because he didn't know which way to go. Yeah. And um, I get it. On a close match like that, on the highest level, sometimes the slimmest of margins make the decision. Um, so it's interesting. It's you gotta, you have to learn as much as you can to to be successful in any sport. And our sport right now, I think, is a, a super pivotal point where they're getting it refined, but they're still making changes. Right. Still making changes. So. When you're making changes every six months to a sport, and then you're not educating the people outside of it, other than people taking that course. So there's 30 of us in there. There was 4,000 competitors. Right. So think you know, I think the only thing that I'll be critical on IBJJF, I think, is you put everything out on video format. You put it on YouTube. Every single rule. Every it's going to be a lot of work. But then people are like, I get it. Right. I get why that was an advantage, or I get why that wasn't. Um, so yeah, it's, it's tough. Yeah. It's important how you disseminate that information, right? Because oh. like you said, I mean, you have 4,000 competitors oh my gosh. and you had a small handful of people, you know, actually in the rules meeting, yeah. there's no way they can communicate that to everybody. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So you got to find a way no. to, uh, to figure out how to, to share that information with people. Yeah. And with, with our Fuji company, we actually did, I've been doing videos, uh, over the last period here and, and I'm hoping um, before January, we have a whole rule section on our uh, on our site just to show these people the most common things. Yeah, the most common things that as a referee, I'm I'm hearing the coach say something. I'm like, he doesn't understand it, mm-hmm. or you know, he does. He's not he's not with me here. Right. Um, we we want to eliminate that as much as we can because the last thing I want to do is is for the coach or the the competitor have a bad experience because they don't understand the rules. And right. if it's my job to, I always say that it's my job to be an educator. 
right? right? It doesn't matter if I'm educating my class or educating someone in a tournament. Um, you have to try to put your best foot forward that way, and so that's that's why we're doing some rules. Right, videos. and you only have so much time before oh, a tournament to actually explain things. You know what I mean? I mean, and you want to keep it running smoothly. You really have zero time. Right. You know, we always say that we have a rules meeting per se, but it's just a general overview of like, mm -hmm. hey guys, and it's more, for, and, and be honest with you, it's not for the competitors, it's really for the spectators. It's just so they go, oh, that's what two points is or whatever, mm -hmm. because you'll get grandma and grandpa yelling too, and, and they have no they idea. Have no, idea. no clue. Um, Jiu-Jitsu is one of those few sports that I think people naturally jump in not quite knowing all the rules where, right. you know, I played basketball in school too. I was a terrible basketball player, but I still played it. I knew the rules. Yeah, it's not a very intricate rule system, some of these other sports. But when you get into grappling, there's a lot of different nuances when you're talking about control of another person. It, it is it is super, uh, super tough to designate some things that you would think would be winning and losing. Um, Jiu-Jitsu is such, such a unique art where if you put someone in the guard, you've got them between your legs and you're on the bottom – you're probably winning, you know, like yeah. you have the attacks. Mm -hmm. um, so from the rules standpoint, from the layman, you may be, okay, the, the person on the top, he's, you know, the person's he's winning. Like, he's, he's winning when the reality, the referee is keeping track of the time on the guy on the top. He, in, in the referee's mind, he's already putting them on the clock. Like you have to escape that guard. Oh, really? Yeah. You need to start passing the guard. You, you have to start working. Yeah. Um, I lost in the 2013 world championships to, uh, the reigning world champion by one penalty. It was a zero zero one penalty match, and it was because I didn't open the guard quick enough. Whoa! Yeah, I was so upset, so upset. So I got the penalty after I stood up because I I thought I knew the time. I thought I knew, knew it, and I uh, got the penalty and lost the match and um, went over to Hoyler. You know, it's probably the only match uh, in the last decade Hoyler's actually uh, coached me on because oh, really? he's tra he's traveling everything. He's you know, it's tough, and he goes should have went sooner. I'm like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> that, that's it, man. That's it. So um, I always think that those are those opportunities. Like as a, uh, as a black belt, made the mistake, so I'll never let my students make that mistake. Right. That's the transfer uh, information. Yeah, he definitely learned. He definitely learned. So, okay, well, I want to back up for half a second um, and then get to, to Fuji because I think you're doing a lot yep. of great things for the well, just the sport in general. Thank um, you. But – how did you get connected with, with Hoyler? So, I mean, you did the traditional martial arts. Yep. There's not a lot going on in, in Missouri. So there, how did you find jiu-jitsu? How did you actually get to Hoyler? It, it's, man, it's so funny because there's a lot of luck involved. But at the end of the day, I think the universe uh, finds its way sometimes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just so weird. So um, I was doing Sambo here in St. Louis. Okay. I, um, I had looked for jiu-jitsu. Let me take a step back. Okay, yeah, what brought you to St. Louis and – Okay, so um, 18 years old, um, Stillville, no jobs, right? I right. just watched my mother and father-in-law lose their job at the factory, like the only major factory in Stillville. The shoe factory, yep. Red Wing. Yep, closed. Yep. So um, I was like, man, there is no – it's not that I want to work – Wanted to work at a factory, but uh, my dad was a carpenter, so I started off uh, in the U Union Carpentry, and we are driving from Stillville to St. Louis every day. Okay. So I was driving an hour and a half each way just to work, and my dad had done that for 30 years. He retired as a Union Carpenter. Real common down in that area. Super common, super common. Um, man, I just did not feel it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I love construction. I was big into development for years and years. Excuse me. Um but I didn't, I didn't think that driving, and, and I saw how it beat my dad down, you know, yeah. really took a, a toll on his body. The day I told my dad, like, I really want to um, do something different, he goes, it's the smartest decision of, life, of your life. I'm like, why didn't you tell me that before I started? You feel weird telling him that? <laughs> um, not really. I, I had a great relationship with my parents. They're ca both characters, but um, my dad's an OBS guy, man, and, yeah. and uh, I told him that, and he still saw me go through the management processes of like working at a lumber yard and and doing things within the industry, mm -hmm. um, but I also realized that um, I thought I thought I always had a good imagination. I always thought I, I could I could see a building um, and see what it looked like done before we started, and I, that's what kind of took over eventually. But backing up. Stillville, no opportunities. Let's move to St. Louis. So at that time, moved up here with my girlfriend um, and thought, 
all right, I'm just going to find a job. Found a job at a, a lumber yard. And, um, you know, just as an 18-year-old kid, you do what you do. Yeah, no just, college education, man. Just figuring uh, it out. Just figuring it out. Just wanted to be away from from that um, lack of opportunity and see what was out in the world. And at that time, man, I mean, I hadn't traveled really. I hadn't done anything uh, outside of the country. Mm-hmm. And I started looking for martial arts because I had stopped there for about nine months um, just to get the apartment, get everything settled, you know. Right. You, you're making like six bucks an hour. So, like, you, you only got so much income. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. eating ramen noodles and ravioli out of the can almost every day. Man, it's uh, been a long way since then. Well, <laughs> it's been an adventure. Um, so, you know, we, we get up there, and I start looking for karate schools. Mm-hmm. The first karate school I walk into, and at this time, I think I turned 19, um, I remember back then, the guy goes, okay, it's $150 a month. It's a two-year co- contract i was like 150 a month in my mind i still don't charge 150 a month at my school today yeah but i just like i'm like well i can't afford that yeah that might as well have been two thousand it could have it it, it could have been a million i'm like yeah okay man and um i tried to communicate with those guys like hey realize i'm on my own i can clean the school i can do anything else I, i go i'm not asking for free but i'm asking for discounted rate something you know to to make it to where i can afford it and there was just a no that's not an opportunity they shut me down and i was mm-hmm. like hmm i'm like okay went to a couple, a couple different places found a taekwondo school um that was down the street still didn't quite have the money um at the same time i used to get black belt magazine that was the the magazine for martial arts back then and i thought man I'm just, you know, keep reading. I got a heavy bag. I'd work out on my own. Um, I love the striking arts. It was very enjoyable for years and years. And I saw an ad. Hoist Gracie comes to Springfield, Missouri, 1995. In Black Belt Magazine. Black Belt Magazine. That's awesome. So I, I call my buddies, and I'm like, hey, man, yeah, we, we've been watching this guy kill everybody. I think it was like UFC 3 had just finished. We, we watched the second one, watched the third one, had to go back to go to Blockbuster or wherever at that time and get a VHS of the first one to see it. Um, I'm like, you want to go? So we had like six or seven of us guys that were all in high school at the same time, met in Springfield, and this was a pretty amazing thing. We all had the money for one day. Like we saved up for like six months to have the money to train for one day. And um, car- hung carpet in a big conference room, you know, no nice mats or anything. And uh, at that time, like I'm, I'm sure like the top of my feet got rubbed raw from the carpet, yeah. you know, <laughs> from doing the training. And, and I was just a total newbie. And um, at the end of the day, I knew I wanted to train with Hoist and buy a T-shirt. I wanted a T-shirt. And uh, his wife happened to be there. And I just wanted to say, thank you, Mr. Gracie. You know, I appreciate your training. And I told her the same. And she, she kind of gave me a funny look and, and – uh, she goes, are you not coming back tomorrow? And I go, we can't afford it. I go, we, we did everything for today. I go, I got a T-shirt. I got to train with the man. I go, I'm, I'm good. And she goes, come here. She pulls me aside. She goes, you bought a T-shirt. You paid for the first day. Yeah, just come tomorrow. She goes, don't worry about it. I'm like, what? Whoa. I'm like, okay. And I'm like, I'm riding with this guy. <laughs> 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 it's like can he come too yeah yeah <laughs> and she goes is he your training partner i go yeah she goes just just come on i'm like oh my god you know so it kind of kind of stepped back and i was like wow they you know she didn't have to do that right. so it was the first glimpse of kindness that i saw really within within the martial arts and it wasn't that my instructors weren't nice in karate or whatever but there was no honestly it was instructor and student no real relationship there you know you just do what i tell you you're gonna get better yeah so just enjoyed the heck out of it. Came back to St. Louis, and this is 95, and I started uh, looking for jiu-jitsu around me. Um, there really wasn't anything in St. Charles at all. Right. And um, I said, okay, there's nothing in St. Charles. What about judo? Next, next, next best, best thing, thing, you know, yeah. Kirkwood Judo Club. Um, so at the same time, I found Kirkwood Judo Club, and I found a guy teaching sambo at a taekwondo school. And I had um, Oleg Tekterov had, had just, like, done some pretty good stuff. And I had heard these Sambo guys. And the guy kind of sold it to me as, well, there's Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. And, like, the Russian style of grappling mm-hmm. is this. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, listen, man, if I can learn grappling, I'm down. sign me up, you mm-hmm. know. And um, at the end of the day, it was, like, 50 bucks a month. 
I'm like, I can afford it. You can do that. I can afford it. So I started training Sambo, and I, I stuck with that for about three and a half years. Uh, the guy that was teaching was here for a limited time uh, when he was in uh, college. So he would teach me during. Uh, yeah, that's probably a big thing here in St. Charles, right? We get we get so many high level high athletes, level. athletes coming yep. through, here, especially with Lindenwood mm-hmm. from all over the world. But the high turnover, they don't stay long, unfortunately. Yeah, and it's um, you know, the winters are rougher here, man. I mean, it's it's people. Missouri is not the destination of of people dream about. Right, right. We know how beautiful it is. Mm-hmm. We, you know, you you enjoy the state. I love it here. Um, but I remember training with the. Uh, Nilson Lamboya, he's from Brazil, and he moved to Kansas City okay. about the same time. He's a Hoyler black belt. He's like six degree now or something. And uh, I saw him last year at our instructors meeting. I was like, man, you don't remember me, but I remember when you came to Kansas City. And he goes, oh, it's so cold. That was his first thing. Like his first thing he said, he's this like, how cold it was. Oh my God, it's too cold for me. I could not. I could not last. So there's been an incredible amount of people come through, just like you said, in the, the wrestling aspect, the martial arts world. Um, and at that time, when my sambo coach left. It was like me and another guy, and we were kind of like the top students at that time. And uh, I was like, I'm not a teacher. I don't want to teach. You take, you do it. So he started teaching. Um, he would end up becoming a black belt under Alliance in Georgia. Okay. He moved to Atlanta and started doing jujitsu with nice. those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when so he left, and then it was me. I was like, so out of default, I was like, man, I really don't want to teach. But the guys are like, hey, just share with us what you know. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay. So at that time. Um, without an instructor, you know, I thought, man, I need to, I need to find somebody that can guide me, not for the short term, but for the long term. And I didn't feel, um, the connection really for any, with anyone here in St. Louis. And I'm like, I want to go right to the source, but who is the world's best at my weight class? I didn't know. So I'm like, I got to find out. So I looked, went on the interwebs, you know, at that time, dial up took me, I'm sure, 20 minutes to get yeah, on. Good old AOL. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I looked up, and who's the world champion in 96, 97, 98, 99? Hoyler Gracie. I was like, well, it's pretty easy to see who the man is in my mm-hmm. weight class. Where does he live? Rio de Janeiro. That's a problem. Yeah. So, a little bit of a distance yeah, issue. Um, so at that time, um, I still did grappling tournaments. Uh, when they were available, very limited back in that day. So the Arnold Classic was a big deal in Ohio mm-hmm. at the time, and they had a gi and a no gi division. And I decided to go up there, and lo and behold, who was one of the guest instructors? Hoyler Gracie. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm a man. I still don't know to this day how I pulled it off, but Hoyler did two private lessons that whole weekend. I got one of them. Oh shit! So what what I did is it was me and four other guys, and I con you know I contacted him. And he's like, "Well, I'm going to be doing a a private lesson for another one of my reps in in that area." Um, sure. We're, we're, you got five of you guys, yeah. So we we all did it as like a little group lesson. And I want to tell you, man, in that hour, the simplest little things that he showed us that. I to to this day I still teach all these little basic things. Yeah. They're timeless. They're timeless. So afterwards, uh, kind of two things happened. Um, afterwards, you could tell he enjoyed it. Like he really took he took the time and and he's he is probably the most charismatic Gracie other than Henzo. You know those two are just they're characters, man. Yeah. And Hoyler may be a little bit more serious at times, but his personality just exudes happiness and and just. A Cool guy. It has an immediate effect on you. It's man. It, it, that, when you're around someone like that, you're like, whoa. I st- I want to stay around that guy. Oh yeah. Because that guy knows what he's doing. He he will put me in a position to succeed. Mm-hmm. So after the lesson, I said, Hoyler, you're me. I'm in St. Louis. He goes, where? <laughs> I go, middle of the country, California, New York. I'm in the middle. Yeah, we usually fly over. That. Yeah, I go the flyover country uh, or state. Um, who do I go talk to? And he goes, I have two reps, really. He goes, in the country. And at this time, you have to think that Hoyler had carried Hickson's flag for a lot of years. They the, lots of history there of, like, how the brothers all split and did right. a, did their own thing. But at the end of the day, um, Hoyler decided – I'm Hoyler was running the original academy, him and his brother, brother Holker, um, and he wanted to do his own thing. He goes, I got two reps, Megaton Diaz in Phoenix, David Adiva in New Jersey, New yep. York. And he goes, I think you fit in with David. And I'm like, 
Okay. So now it's not Rio. It's New Jersey, New York. So it's a little bit more obtainable. Right. I had no kids. I had a good job at this time. I kind of flat, flash forward into my early 20s. Um, always been a guy that I'll work 70 or 80 hours a week. And I'd, oh, wow. I'd save, 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 you know. And I said, okay, I'm going to go go hang out with David and, and try to train with him. He gave me a cell phone number. No problem. A couple months go by. Call David. And uh, he's like, where are you at? He's like, what? He goes, well, I'm sorry, like. The Ribeiro brothers are here. We're training. He goes, uh, uh, we'll talk later. I'm like, all right. I mean, this guy doesn't know who I am. He doesn't right. care. And um, This kid just calls. This kid. Who's this kid? And I'm, I, man, I, I get so many calls that are like that that I try to be like, don't be that guy. Like, yeah. give people time. You never know what's going to happen. It's tough when you're on the other side, though, and you're busy. <sighs> it is. It is. Yeah. Um, so I see Hoyler is going to come spend a month. And he did this for years. He would go to California spend a couple of weeks, and then he'd come out and he'd live with David for a month, and he'd do seminar tours all over the East Coast. And he hit a seminar every day. Oh, man. So here's the crazy thing. At David's house, there's a bunch of mats in the basement. He would do two to three hours of private lessons at David's house, and then he would go teach a seminar that night. Uh, and that would happen until he went back to Brazil. Every other, you know, there's a couple of days, like in the weekend stuff, maybe he doesn't do lessons. Find out he's in, in New Jersey. Call my buddy up. I'm like, hey. You want to go to New York? I'm like, I'll, I want to go spend a week. I'm going to go spend a week with these guys and train. I'm like, I'm uh, at this time, I'm so thirsty. I'm so, I'm like, I just need this, yeah. this pure jujitsu. Um, so fly out. I didn't tell him I was coming. It's been about six months since I've seen Hoyler. Walk into uh, my good friend Armando's academy in New York. He runs an academy in uh, North Carolina now. And uh, sign up. And he's like, okay, have you ever trained jujitsu? And I'm like, like once, like not really, man. I'm I'm okay. I've got the white belt on. I'm totally happy. Sit over, and there's probably 50 people in this uh, academy. We're waiting. We're waiting. Here comes David and Hoyler. Hoyler gets halfway walk into the changing room, and he's looking and he's saying, and he looks at me. He goes, JW, what are you doing here? Six months. Oh wow. And I go, oh, like I'm just here. He's to probably train. taught thousands of people. Oh. Un- in six unreal. Months, I mean, realistically, Real, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's just, I'm set back. I'm like, yeah. oh my God. So he gets changed, and uh, it's really the first time I meet David. And uh, David is an unbelievable, unbelievable guy. And uh, he comes back in. He goes, okay, guys, you know, he's getting started. And he grabs me, and he uses me for the first half of the seminar. Uh, dude, I just, I'm on cloud nine. Oh, yeah. I'm just like, man. So, um, you know, we're talking, and David's like, where are you from? And I'm trying to explain to him. They don't, you know, David's actually from Israel. Oh. And he used to spend six months out of the year in Brazil. So he has no idea. Like he's East Coast guy. That's, yeah. that's basically where he was at. And trying to tell him, you know, whatever, a little small talk, you know, at the seminar. And Hoyler, after everyone's leaving, he goes, what are you doing? You want to go to dinner? I'm like, of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah. So my buddy that's with me is just, you know, fanboying out. He goes, we're going to dinner with Hoyler Grace. This, this yeah, is unbelievable. crazy. So we're sitting at dinner and, I, you know, just a little pizza place or whatever. And um, you start seeing, like, the Gracie diet come in, like, how they're ordering, how it's so different and, and uh, just alien to me. I'm like, what? Yeah. You're eating without sauce or, mm-hmm. you know, just a little it's a thing. way different lifestyle. Way different lifestyle. And um, we're sitting there, and he goes, okay, so what, uh, you just here for vi- on vacation? I go, well, I'm on vacation to train jiu-jitsu. And David looks at me, and he goes, you're only here for jiu-jitsu? He goes, you traveled here for one day? I go, no, I'm here for a week. I go, I saw your seminars are all week. I'm going to go to every one of them. And Hoyler just kind of sits back in his chair. He goes, you're going to go to every one of them. I go, yeah. I go, I'd like to book a private lesson every day while I'm here too. And he looks at David and he looks at me and he goes, okay. And he's like, you're serious, man. He goes, all right, man. Um, he goes, be at David's house at 10 a.m. So I was there at 10 a.m. And he told me to stay and help with all the other lessons. Oh, man. So what happened was if – the guy needed to roll, I'd roll with him. Hoyler would see it, make the adjustments. If I needed beat on, like, the you know, like bad positions, the guys would work on their positioning. Um, so I basically did that for like four days in a row. The amount of jiu-jitsu that I got Holy cow. W- was just un- unbelievable, unbelievable, because Hoyler would demonstrate it on me. Mm-hmm. I'd feel it how it was supposed to have been done. That's so important. To oh man, feel it like once you feel the instructor That's the do secret. it to you. Oh yeah. my goodness, because you know how it's supposed to feel. Man. You know what perfect is, and then you just have to try to recreate exactly. it. Exactly. So what I found out after that, 
I think we had one Saturday. I think one Saturday night they went and did something. We didn't go over there. So we just went and hit Manhattan or, you know, did, did the New York thing. After um, getting ready to leave, we're in David's. I'll never forget this. I was in David's kitchen. And, um, you know, Hoyler looks at me. He goes, what do you want? What do you want out of jujitsu? And I go, at this point, Hoyler, I go, I can't get enough. I just can't get enough jujitsu. I go, I want you to accept me as a student. I go, if you say that I'm a student of Hoyler Gracie and David Adiv, I'm happy. I don't care about belts. I don't care about anything else. I go, just let me train. And uh, he goes, done. You're a student. He <laughs> goes, but, he goes, when you go back to St. Louis, he goes, your school is going to start transforming. And it wasn't a school. It was a club, right? It was like 15, 20 guys that I had at that time. And what I realized is I spent probably four or five years training in art that within days I knew I was missing such a massive amount of content that I pretty much needed to shelf everything I knew, start over from the beginning, and understand that the way Hoyler taught me, he formatted it in such a way that I could help other people learn. It, oh, yeah. You know? It's an actual system there. It, re it really was. And uh, it took me years and years to figure out that at the end of the day, we, we all need the same foundation, okay, the foundation of understanding the body mechanics, the movement. That's where David really helped me a lot. Um, and then on top of that foundation, it's your responsibility to, to choose which building blocks and bricks you want to apply. Yeah. So at that point, uh, he goes, okay, go to St. Louis. Uh, here's my patch. Put that on your back. Any students? They're now Hoyler Gracie. Mm -hmm. And that's how it all started, man. It, it was I didn't go with the intent of bringing back Hoyler Gracie Jiu-Jitsu to St. Louis. I went with the intent of bringing – Getting JW better, yeah. not sucking as much, right, mm -hmm. and being a better martial artist, um, and then, man, kind of took off from there. And, yeah. and with those guys, Hoyler told me one time, uh, and the reason that I think that they hold me to a higher standard, he goes, JW, he goes, the the reason we put so much pressure on you and and um, we're so happy with what you're doing is because. A very simple thing. He goes, if we tell you to do something, you do it. If you say you're going to do something, you do it. Yeah, it's that simple. It's that simple. And yeah. I think that's the the simplicity of just business and success. You just do what you say you're going to do. It sounds easy. <laughs> it does sound easy, doesn't it? <laughs> and um, you, so I I got a few really key things yeah. from from that whole um, story right there. Um, one, the energy that you put out is. 100% the energy that you receive. I'm yep. a firm believer in that. You yep. know what I mean? Like, you're just putting out positive energy, and then you connected with Hoyler. Like, so the first time you trained with him at yep. the Arnold's, did you yep. just call him? Yeah. We, we basically, I found a number to a manager. Mm -hmm. um, man, I can't even remember how it all unfolded. But I remember calling and them telling us, no, we can't do it. And then us calling back and go, I got five guys. We want to do this. Like, come on, you know, let us in. Right. Like, all right, all right, we'll just show up at this time. Yeah. So it takes me to the next point. You you acted and like you didn't take no for it. Like, yeah. like there wasn't any real road barrier. Like you knew what you wanted, so you found a way to make it happen. Like, do I have to go here? Don't be afraid do to ask for the sale. Right? Exactly. Right. Don't be af don't be afraid. And I think that's uh, you can see that in parallels and all types of businesses. Mm -hmm. Is like sometimes like just talking about it. You're not going to get anywhere. But right. if you're you're not afraid to be able to really put yourself out there and say, this is what I want, people will see that and they'll, they'll be more apt to get on board. Right, right. Yeah. And and even though you were told no the first time, mm -hmm. you're like, hey, man, you got to help me out here. <laughs> like you, you sold yourself right. to get into that situation. So then you go you go to New York and you're – you're you're con you're connected with Hoyler again for a whole week. Yep. But you went there you you went there without any expectation. You went yeah. to train without with you're just trying to get better. You know yeah. what I mean? And then he could see that and then from there it just it just blossomed into mm -hmm. essentially kind of where we're at today, right? So you came back um you revamped your entire school yeah. cuz before then you're essentially if, if my head is right, you're kind of teaching like a, a blend between sambo and jujitsu. Yep. And, and and if you think about it, 
I only taught what I knew. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so yeah. uh, and, you know, you, you look at it back then, and I even think, like, even after I got my blue belt and purple belt and stuff like that, it's um, still all, all I could do was try to teach what they taught me. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I was always a pretty good listener and was able to, as soon as they taught me something, I'd drill it, drill it, drill it, drill it, drill it, make sure it's right. And then once I rolled with that concept, I'd see the problem. So the next time I would see Hoyler, we'd start off right where we ended. Yeah. And we'd start again. I'd be like, this is the problem I'm having. One time was funny. Um, almost, I think, a year went by. The time I went to David's house, the next time. He started off the lesson by going, okay, we were in side control, and here we did this a year. Wow. Dude, I'm telling you, the guy is unbelievable. He, just, he just has, like, this mental catalog, this index yeah, he, of what he he's trained with true, who and when. Well, I just think he's truly one of the most gifted uh, individuals on the planet. Yeah. You know, not only can he compete at the highest level, he can teach at the highest level. Um, and he proved to me for years and years and years that um, I was a value. Like, he put effort into me. And that effort turned into i think we have like seven or eight affiliates and all over the midwest and, yeah and all these other stuff like he's seen that i'm able to take people to a certain level and then he's able to fine tune them i always say he's like the uh, ferrari mechanic mm. you know it's still a ferrari but he can twist it and make it just a little, just a little bit, bit better get that, get that one percent that's oil yeah i think that says a lot about your character because he trusted you enough to to further his legacy and his mission you yeah. know what i mean and um since since you've you've essentially kind of just taken on that that challenge, if you will, of his, and you've grown it, and you said you have several seven or eight affiliates yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, um, I mean, and the th- guys that are uh, anywhere from black belt to brown belts that run academies mm-hmm. throughout the Midwest. Yeah, it seems like you've now taken the next step, and now it's it's become this situation where you know you're learning, you're learning, you're learning. You've been progressing his mission and and just growing jujitsu if you will and yep. now it's there's this other it, from the outside perspective me just kind of watching you you started fuji mm-hmm. uh bjj and now that's like that's the continuation of that but it's also now your own legacy and like it's it's you giving back and growing the sport i mean i feel like fuji's done so much for the sport um i've been training i started in 2009 and I can remember just it, it's, it's been nine years, but I can remember even then the only show in town was like Naga would come around. You know what I mean? Yep. So there wasn't um, there wasn't all these other circuits that you could go to and, and do a tournament, and there there weren't a lot of manufacturer of geese, and there yep. wasn't just this whole network and support. And like you have the mats, right? The mats is is, is the mats you as well? It's, it's not me. Okay. Um, I'll tell you that I I'm probably like one of their number one salespeople that make no money on them because yeah. like uh, <laughs> the cool thing about it is uh, Jimmy Pedro, which is the Olympic judo coach, Olympic world champion, um, for Team USA, um. Is the mat owner? Okay. So Jimmy owns that. So there's really we call it the Fuji family because yeah. we really um, <clears throat> before Fuji it was Kozen. Okay. So so we had the Kozen grappling before Kozen grappling. I was just throwing one tournament a month or one tournament a year, just so that Team Vagi, Team JW, Team Ever, just like we let's not drive eight hours to compete. Yeah. Let's I mean, drive. Let's drive the jujitsu here. Yeah. Let's let's get something going here to where it's. Um, the more you compete, the more deficiencies you find, you fix it. And then if you do fly to California, you're not finding it out there. Right. You know, so yeah. I, I always just thought, let's put on a quality event and give to give my students the opportunity to compete here locally. That kind of took on a whole, um, I guess 2013, we came up with Cozen. Um, it's a unique, and, unique story from the standpoint of um, a guy at my school said, I'm going to make a gi. And I said, okay, man. Like, there's there's people that make gis out there. Yeah, why are you going to do that? Why are you going to do it? Um, Vince Anselm. So he, he goes, man, he goes, I'm, I'm spending $200 on these show-year-old gis. He goes, I can make a better gi. I'm like, whatever you want to do, bud. Just do whatever. Follow your heart, man. <laughs> whatever. Uh, and in that time, man, I wore a Tama, Krugans, Fuji, um, Fuji, and being tied into this little story, the very first Fuji prototype Yi I got to try on because David Adiv was good friends with the owner, Leah Hatashita. Leah owns Fuji Sports, which is literally the biggest 
jiu-jitsu and judo manufacturer in the world. Okay. No, I did not know that. Yeah. So, <clears throat> the Mizuno Gis, all the U.S. judo team, all these other things, it's the same company. Okay. So, we're here we are, 2013. We want to, um, I'm throwing small tournaments. I, sa- I decide to make four tournaments a year. I'm like, let me go to Kansas City. Let me go here and there. Not not thinking it would um, do anything, but just get a local, you know, aspect of mm-hmm. it. Um it was going to help my family. I thought, well, from a revenue stream, like, if you go into jiu-jitsu thinking you're going to make money, you're a crazy person, yeah. right? So, um, 2009 is when I opened up my fu- my school full-time. Okay. I th- Until then, I'd always worked for someone else, and I taught two to three days a week. So, I, I'd always done it on the side. So, I need, I, you know, I kind of see that, like, well, maybe there's opportunity there. When Vince says, I want to make a gi, I go, okay, no big deal. He starts selling at the academy. It's a really good quality gi. I was actually like kind of set back. I mean, this is really good. And he asked me, he goes, hey, can we sell it at the next tournament? And something popped in my head, and I still can't figure out why this popped in my head. And I said, Vince, I go, let's do something different. I go, let's brand the tournament off of the gi. I go, let's say Cozen presents, you know, Cozen Fighter, his, his brand at that time, presents this tournament. And I go, let's set up a booth and, you know, merchandise it. He goes, okay. I go, I want to do something else. I go, I want to sit another manufacturer, uh, their whole table right beside it. And I want to see which one sells better. Hmm. And I go, it's just like a little beta test. I go, let's just kind of see. After that first tournament, we um, we sold a lot, a lot of branded merchandise for that tournament. The other people sold $25 worth of stuff. <laughs> you guys shut them down. And it wasn't anything that we planned on doing, but what we realized was the people wanted the products that was branded off of the company. And I said, we have to make an immediate change. Yeah. I go, we, we need to make geese, multiple styles. Mm-hmm. We got to sell T-shirts, rash guards, everything. And he was super excited. He's a super hard worker, too. Um, started ordering them. So mm-hmm. we made an agreement that... Um, he bought into my company. We bought new dolomer mats. We get we, we got all this. It's important that uh, we did that. So we started throwing the Cozen tournaments. My next idea was the real game changer, and it was this needs to be out there for other people to be successful. And I knew that we were going to do nine events that year, um, and it immediately made an impact in my home life. So now I'm like, I can afford to take my kids on a vacation. Yeah. You know, as a jiu-jitsu instructor, man, like, we're scraping by, scraping by. And um, my wife worked full-time, and, you know, full-time, she's dropping the kids off at the schools, I'm going. I mean, it was just insane for a few years. Um, and I realized, like, as soon as that started hitting, I go, man, we're better in my life. I'm better in Vincent and, and Krista and their family's life. I'm like, why can't we recreate this? Why hasn't someone franchised this business yeah and um we did the numbers started crunching the numbers like if i'm going to supply my goal has always been 10 franchises in the in the country um because i thought that would give the market enough market share for people to throw 18 tournaments a year wouldn't which be, is a lot yeah, it wouldn't be saturated wouldn't be saturated point. so um always looking in my mind like i'm always looking to like how can i better people how can i you know how can i put these in a position where other jiu-jitsu instructors couldn't maybe make a living um, after we crunched the numbers, we realized we would never be able to keep up with manf- the manufacturing. Oh, really? We were, what, what do you mean in what way? In the geese, the rash guards, everything we're doing. If I had 10 franchises going at one time, we would actually have to become a manufacturer. Oh, to keep up with the demand. Yeah. Okay. So, um, it, at, the next day I called Lee Hadashita, which is the owner of Fuji. And I said, I've got an idea. And she goes, I've been watching. She goes, I know, I know what you're doing. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. No I go, surprise there. Yeah. And um, she goes, how quick can you get to New York? I'm like, oh, man. Like, she's, she's waiting for you. She's call. ready to listen. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I said, two weeks. She goes, okay, me and Jimmy Pedro are going to meet you here, and we're going to go through the, through the meeting. And I pitched them the idea of using Fuji mats, selling Fuji gear, and us using our franchise system and uh, being the first ever provider of – uh, jiu-jitsu tournaments for different people, th- uh, but with using the same systems. Mm-hmm. And uh, before we walked out of the meeting, the meeting was supposed to be like an hour and a half, like four hours later. At the end of the me- meeting, they go, we want to do it. 
come up with a realistic number and everything that it's going to take to get this done um, and uh, make sure it's quick. Yeah. So we walked out of that meeting going, wow, like this is a real possibility. I got a text five minutes later, and they're like, we want the number today. Oh, wow. So like they're trying to move immediately. They, they, they saw, I think they saw me and Vince's passion. They seen the platform that we were giving Fuji mats to be into all these different cities. Um, and believe me, as many emails I get and send to Fuji mats, people want quality mats. That's oh, all. Yeah. That. Those mats are great, man. What do you need in your academy? You need a uniform, Fuji Sports. <laughs> you need mats, Fuji, Fuji mats. And if you're going to have somebody go compete, go compete at a Fuji tournament. So it all meshed together perfectly. Um, took us about seven months of attorneys. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that that was an undertaking, probably the toughest part of the transition. Um, we sold our cozen or our, our Dolomer mats, uh, which I'm thankful of now because uh, I had them at my school and had to get rid of them after a year. Um, and then we started running into Fuji tournaments. I guess 2015 Springfield, uh, Illinois was our first our first event. Then it took me about nine months to take that first tournament to sell our first franchise. That was in uh, Texas. Okay. So we're up to seven franchises now. The eighth one's probably going to come on board in the next 30 days. Um, and I got two more areas. I got upper, like, Oregon, Washington area, and I got the Carolinas. So I got to figure out those two areas uh, with our very rich in jiu-jitsu. But I'm trying to do a good job on, even if someone, I've probably got 300, 400 emails on people wanting to do fran the franchise, but you have to have the right person. Yeah, you definitely have to vet, you know, that person. I mean, that's a whole process it, on its own, it, I'm it's, sure. It's tough. It's tough. And at the end of the day, I, I hate to say it this way, but I assume people want to work as hard as I do. Yeah. Man. It's a tough assumption. It, to it's, 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 a, it's a tough <laughs> assumption because um, I can provide the training. I can provide the, the platform for success, mm -hmm. but you still have to be successful for yourself. Um and when these guys see me online at 2 a.m. and go, why are you working? I, I enjoy it. Yeah, it's not work. <laughs> it's it's not, just it's like, man. You're living your purpose. You know what I mean? It, it, I think you said something very important. You just kept saying, how can I help people? How yep. can I help more people with something that's helped me? You know what I mean? And I think having that um, that that frame of mind is, is, a, is extremely important because if you go into it and you're just trying to figure out how can I help me, how can I help me, how can I help me, that's not authentic, and people will see that. And it, that, that doesn't succeed in business, at least not for long. No, and, and, and honestly, like, if I wanted to make a lot of money, I'd been in a different career. Yeah. Yeah, that's just a, it's just a fact. That's just a fact. Yeah. Um, now, I will tell you that I've definitely went far beyond what I thought was capable of in jiu-jitsu. Like, I, I, I feel like I hit a certain little sweet spot there to where I'm very happy that I'm able to put this out there. Um Fuji has been an unbelievable supportive company. Jimmy Pedro is one of the smartest, hardest working individuals I've ever met in my life. So to put yourself with someone else that is like kind of a leader, you see him like he'll email me back at four AM and I'm like from Kagakistan or whatever the judo team. Yeah, yeah something crazy and I'm like, How are world. you working it? You know, it's just crazy. Um so we're we we've done a, a good job of getting them out there. We still have growth we just implemented our own private branded software system and bracketing software oh wow yeah uh vince my partner uh that started cozen the gi <laughs> um he is a computer genius he really is he's smart smart dude and um i'll tell him what i want what i'm thinking about and then he goes on and develops crazy stuff so our software is pretty cool we can stop weigh-ins at 9 30 that morning of push a button and as many people as you have, I can have brackets in like five seconds. That's awesome. Unbelievable. That's amazing. That's a game changer right it, there. It really is. And, and it's one of those things where it's – it's we're not paying someone else to develop that either. So we, we're a little bit more invested into understanding like um, we test it all the time. I think we – out of our franchises right now, five of them have the software because we have to go implement it, train them again, mm -hmm. kind of on how, how to do it. But it's been a really neat experience. And people love to see that. They love to see their, their name on the TV board. Um, we're one of the few people now in the industry, like you can basically, you're getting live updates on your phone. You just click it and you're seeing your name, where mm -hmm. you're at in the tournament, um, all the way through getting your medal. So it's, again, try to innovate, but try to do it in a way that um, it makes it easy for the consumer, makes mm -hmm. it easy for the people. 
we know at Fuji, like we're going to be one of the uh, the events. It's probably one of the your first couple events, or uh, like your yourself is like once you get to the purple, the brown, and the black, and especially in the age parameters, you get fewer and fewer. Yeah. So it's super tough to find people uh, matches, but um, it's one of those things where. We just try to do the best we can. Uh, whoever signs up, we try to bra- bracket them yeah. to the closest parameters we have. And then, uh, like in the St. Louis tournament this year, we'll probably have over 450 competitors. So it's really easy. Yeah. You get that many people, it's yeah, just, yeah. just moving forward. We get those forward. big hub cities. I not say that we're a hub, but, like, yeah. you know, people kind of travel from all the rural areas and yep. different things. And, um, yeah, that's awesome because I think it's even more important – I don't know if I should say it's more important, but when you're a white belt and you're a blue belt and you're just you're just new in the game and you don't have a lot of experience, especially in competition. Yeah, I mean that's where you know tournaments shine, like yours, where you you have how many how many events are you putting on like every every month? There's yeah. a tournament, right? So what's crazy about it is we'll do one to two tournaments a month per franchise. Exactly. So there's a lot of tournaments. There's there's tons. So, so much opportunity. So much and. That has always been our goal. Like I always feel like the IBJJF, there's like a world championship. There's one. They're yeah. g- they're going to be it forever. Mm-hmm. No matter if someone tries to come in and say they're, it's never going to be. It's their, it's theirs, right? First first on the block, innovators. They're they're established. They're yeah. established. We are here to prepare people for that if they choose. It's to get the experience, right? Get mm-hmm. get as many matches as you can. Right. And if you choose that you want to be at the elite, well, you keep going keep going forward yeah um but our bread and butter is going to be bringing jujitsu to communities that necessarily wouldn't be a hub Mm -hmm. right that wouldn't get uh so we go to springfield missouri springfield illinois we'll get 200 competitors pretty easy at Mm -hmm. those um but other people won't go to those cities because they're not big enough right and that's the almost our opposite concepts like we want to go to the smaller areas so people have the chance to not spend thousands of dollars on airfare and all this other stuff to, to compete um so it's pretty fun. Yeah, I love that. And I had the opportunity to compete at the Columbia, Missouri tournament yeah. that you had with my son. And That's I was awesome. Like, I was like, man, like how many opportunities do you get to compete with your kids? So I thought yep. that was just awesome. And Jiu-Jitsu and Fuji was able to make that happen. So, yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. So, well, I want to be um, respectful of your time right at an hour, dude. That, that flew by. It, it, it goes quick, right? Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, how can folks, um, anywhere you want to direct folks, if they want to say hi, get a hold of you, ask questions, um, anything you want to plug? Yeah, um, honestly – I appreciate your time. I appreciate uh, being having a platform for anyone's success. So I hope this podcast keeps getting more and more viewers and, and listeners. Man, it's uh, it's awesome to see other people being able to do something with jujitsu and be able to um, spread that art and hopefully bring more people to our our wonderful art. Yeah. We both know how much it's changed our lives and um, just been an asset to uh, be in the community of jujitsu. Um, so I'm always on Facebook, JW Wright. Just type it in. Um, if you feel like competing and giving Fuji a try, uh, it's FujiBJJ.com. Super easy. Uh, if, I always say this anytime I, I do a podcast or anything, if you haven't trained jiu-jitsu and you want to try it, message me and let me put you in contact with the person in the city closest to you. Yeah. Send me a message. I have no problem at all putting you into contact with who I think would be a great fit for you in that area. Um, Jiu-jitsu can change your life. I don't care what age you are. I don't care uh, kids, grandma, grandpa. Get into jiu-jitsu and let it change your life. Um, I know that I wouldn't be sitting here with you today. Uh, We never know where jiu-jitsu is going to take us. I've been been all over the world and and lucky enough to meet some of my best friends and um, hopefully – I'll be able to use that platform of jiu-jitsu to change many, many people's lives throughout my lifetime. Um, so if I can help someone find and start that path, it'd be it'd be my honor. Great, great. And I'll put everything in the show notes so people can find you. They can awesome. find your school if they want to come check you out. Thank you. And um, all right, everybody, until next time. <laughs>